This episode is sponsored by Rego. Paul Evans was a metalsmith, sculptor, and furniture designer who crossed boundaries. He pioneered a new and provocative type of furniture, and his talent and entrepreneurial skills have brought him into the forefront of the American studio movement during the post-war years. He was a revolutionary who, through a distinctive artistic vocabulary, proved that furniture could be conceptualized as a form of an expressive art. If we think about Paul Evans over the whole course of his career, we're really looking at somebody who is as inventive as a sculptor as he is as a furniture designer and a furniture maker. The ideas flowed continually on a daily basis. There's always sketching, and then uh, we were able to take those sketches into uh, sample pieces and the rest is history as far as where Paul Evans went. My father was a dynamic and passionate man. I think he loved people. He was a real people person. Paul Evans is special to me at least because I grew up in the New Hope area. My father was an artist. And so that sensibility of what New Hope was in the 60s. His furniture is functional art that reveals itself slowly and deliberately but only after boldly and unashamedly knocking you and everything else around it out. When I first saw my f first piece of Paul Evans, I had an instant coup de foudre. I was, I had to have this piece of furniture. With the emergence of the secondary market for American studio furniture around the year 2000, a revival of interest in Evans' work began to take shape. In recent years, we've witnessed a tremendous growing in Paul Evans' market. Primarily, they're design collectors. They recognize that something unusual was going on with, with a, a lot of Paul Evans' work, especially during the studio period and maybe the early years of directional. But they're very distinctive. Some would say weird. Uh, and they're definitely that. And, and consequently, we, we've got a collector base uh, in South America all throughout Europe and across America, of course, for Paul Evans' work. The market for Paul Evans' furniture had reached a new peak in 2009 when the design collection of prolific party planner Robert Isabel was offered for sale. Isabel adored fireworks, flowers, hip-hop clubs, but more than all, he admired the work of Paul Evans. He was this incredibly handsome, elegant figure who would just sort of materialize only at the exhibition, usually bringing a few of his friends with him who were all like bold-faced names. And he would come in to the exhibition and very quietly look at a piece, ask me a question, and then before I knew it, he had purchased it at auction. And we took great pains to turn it into a spectacular single owner catalog experience because we had the opportunity to photograph the collection in its original environment down in his townhouse in West Village. And he had created these grotto-like environments where he had uh, installed his Paul Evans and juxtaposed it with works by Prouvé, Nakashima, and others. It seemed like Robert acquired these pieces when nobody else did, uh, many of which were quite uh, difficult in their shape or form. They were site specific and he mounted them all over his townhouse and it, it, just, it, it just made everybody sit up. I knew him because he was my neighbor in East Hampton and in the New York scene back in the 90s, everyone sort of knew Robert Isabel. Have you been to the house? Do you remember seeing I, those pieces? I had been to the house back in the late 90s. I didn't understand it back then because it was so many pieces, you know, he had a lot of pieces of Paul Evans, but I knew that I loved it. I didn't know Robert, but his collection uh, resonated with me on many levels and it was not just because of his Paul Evans pieces, 
but the other things that he collected side by side with Paul Evans. Today, Evans' pieces illustrate catalogs of some of the best design auctions in the world and can be found in homes from France to Malaysia, from Japan to Russia, far, far from where they had started their lives. Paul Evans uh, was based in New Hope. This is where most of his furniture was acquired at the, at the time. The first piece of Evans we au auctioned was in 1991 when uh, I was first contacted about Evans for my earliest sale in 91, I walked into what was the old schoolhouse on Main Street. And it's, it's, uh, now it's a private residence, but at the time it, was, it was, had been the old schoolhouse and it was filled with Paul Evans sprayed bronze furniture. Well, most of them uh, either lived in Philadelphia or suburbs, New York City, and would come to New Hope uh, on the weekend. Uh, and come into the showroom, they were only open on Saturday night or by appointment. And these people would go to the Bucks County Playhouse and afterwards they would strum around New Hope, go to the different restaurants and they'd wander into the showroom and then Paul and Phil were usually both there and uh, rarely did you get out without buying something. They were that good. I don't think you des decide to become a collector of anything. It's, uh, I think it's like a friendship, it's, it sneaks up on you. You don't realize it until it sort of happened to you. And the first piece I believe I saw was a sofa uh, that was, I believe, in crushed velvet. And I remember that I reacted to it. And, and one reaction was, where would you ever put that? I probably got to give kudos to, to David Rago and John Solo, who introduced a ton of Paul Evans at their auctions. When I first bought a piece, I still remember the piece uh, as a sideboard, a fabulous sideboard, and, but it was, it was so strong as I, I just uh, said, this is, this is really fabulous. Paul Evans' artistic language was radical, personal, and dynamic, moving from brutalism to pop, from up art to minimalism, from streamlining to disco. It can be difficult to place Paul Evans because his life and his career really falls into chapters. So he created bodies of work, almost like a fashion designer, creating one collection after another. But if we want to situate him a little bit, really the best thing to think about is what's happening in the arts more broadly in America in the 1950s and 60s. Of course, this is the time when abstract expressionist painting is still very popular. You also have minimalist design and minimalist sculpture coming along in the 1960s. And Paul Evans really pays attention to what's around him. He's very alive visually, so he's aware of things. He has his radar up. And so we could perhaps compare him, for example, to artists like David Smith, the great sculptor who also used welding in his work. I was driving down South Dixie in West Palm Beach, and this piece was in the window. I thought, oh my god, <laughs> what is that? And I went in, and I instantly fell in love, and I had to have it. And it was expensive for me at the time. Nothing like what they're worth today, but I thought, you know what? I have to have it. What I, what's interesting about Paul Evans' style and how I am able to use it so much is that it's very varied. And it actually plays well off of different periods and also different contemporary artists making furniture. There's always a place in an apartment for a piece of Paul Evans. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if it's right or not. And, I think there is. <laughs> and your clients, are they, uh, how are they reacting to Paul Evans? They know that it's not one look, and everyone's apartment tends to reflect their taste. Even though it's translated by me, it's not a stamped look that everybody has to have the same look. But Paul Evans' work is so varied that you can always find a place to make it work in, in, a different, interior, in different interiors. What have you learned from him as a designer? My father taught me about shape, shadow, and scale three of the elements that make up a great product. He was a genius of applied finishes. If you look at his work, it went from paint on steel, from patina, uh, oxidized, polished chrome, metal, bronze, aluminum, uh, cardboard we experimented with, acrylics. 
Paul Evans was born in Newtown, Pennsylvania in 1931. His incredible skills in traditional metal smithing were developed at the School for American Craftsmen at the Rochester Institute of Technology. The School for American Craftsmen was the most important institution for training as a maker in the 1950s and 60s in America. It had been founded by Eileen Osborne Vanderbilt Webb, who was really the great patron of the whole post-war American craft movement. So in addition to that school, uh, which was in Rochester, she also founded the Museum of Contemporary Crafts, which is now the Museum of Arts and Design. She founded the American Crafts Council, the World Craft Council in 1964. These were the institutions that really supported him. Indeed. At the beginning of his career. Indeed. So he uh, showed in uh, Designer Craftsman USA in 1953, an exhibition that Webb had made happen at the Brooklyn Museum, and then also in an exhibition called Craftsmanship in a Changing World in 1956. That was the first exhibition ever held at the Museum of Contemporary Crafts the museum that Webb had founded. So really, she was a very crucial figure in his life. It's also very significant that Evans studied at Cranbrook, which of course was where Harry Bertoia had studied and was teaching in the metal shop. And uh, their work is important to consider together. When moving back to Pennsylvania in 1955, Evans settled in Bucks County and began collaborating with self-taught furniture designer, Philip Lloyd Powell. Well, they mix their pieces together, and there'll be times when uh, the client liked Phil's stuff more, but Phil would always try to pull Paul Evans in, or vice versa, if Paul, they want a lot of metal. Uh, they, they fed each other. Do you know those pieces that they did together? Yes, I do. do you, have you ever had them? No, I have not, but I find that they, they married pieces together in, in a very unique way. I always have a feeling when I look at them that these pieces were really designed by Philip Powell. The wood of Phil Powell with metalwork of Paul Evans combined, in terms of the wood furniture with Evans sort of uh, attributes added to them. The collaborative pieces made by Evans and Powell fall in the two realms. Number one, decorative objects salt and pepper shakers, serving platters, things for the kitchen and the dining room. But number two, they tended to make wall units, larger built-in pieces that are not as, as movable as a chair or a coffee table. You don't really see Evans and Powell collaborating on, on chairs or coffee tables or smaller pieces of furniture. So I think people don't really understand the importance of the collaboration between Powell and Evans that two artists who were basically competitors with one another in the same town at the same place chose to work together. By 1959, Evans achieved his mature language, shaping the metal in his own signature way and departing completely from the tradition metal smithing in which he was trained at school. He began creating his iconic sculptured front, colorful cabinets and screens, which have ultimately become his most important contribution to the story of American modern design. I think it's the defining piece, or the defining series of pieces. But I think over time, is the, the iconic image of Paul Evans is more likely to be a sculptured front piece. Paul Evans had two homes, one in New Hope, which is around here, um, and then he also had a summer house in Nantucket. And I wonder how was he living with his furniture in these homes? His New Hope house was furnished with prototypes, ideas that were half-baked, and others that had just perhaps even failed miserably. But the house in Nantucket, Mizzentop, um, was a composition that he and his wife Bunny put together uh, quite elegantly. Uh, it was featured in House Beautiful probably in the 80s. Uh, it was a lovely composition of loose cobblestone floors and mirrored Paul Evans furniture. Paul Evans moved to a larger shop which allowed him to accommodate more equipment to experiment with new techniques in a laboratory setting and to expand the number of workers. 
Dorsey Redding was one of them and he had become Evan's right arm in the years to come. He called the local high school in Lamberville, New Jersey, asked the uh, industrial arts teacher if had anyone there doing metalwork. I went to New Hope to Mel's restaurant where they all gathered, uh, had lunch with Paul and Phil together. And basically we had a good time. It wasn't a, it wasn't a regular workshop. It was, it was just like we were all friends there talking and, and creating a product. My father designed in a room with no windows. I was always surprised that he didn't peer out into nature, but I think that his uh, creative genius came from within him. Evans was weaving the facades in collages of bronze, steel, brass, enamel, and gold leaf. But along with the metaphor of soft textiles, these cabinets also manifest brutalism, appearing like a miniature versions of the massive concrete building that flooded the world during Evans' lifetime. One of the most interesting things to me about those sculptured front pieces is that they're mix and match. So there's a vocabulary that Evans has created almost like letters in an alphabet, and they can be rearranged. And in fact, that was happening live and in the shop. And Evans was there, but the craftspeople were actually doing it uh, experimentally. But clearly, he's also thinking about painting. You know, he is very interested in Picasso. He's very interested in abstract expressionist painters of his own generation. And he's really thinking of this heavy metal furniture. It was very difficult to produce, uh, but he's thinking of it as a painter would, so he's working quickly or giving the impression of speed. Uh, Dorsey Redding once told me that they'd be, they, he'd be there with the welder's mask on and the, and the welding torch and, and Paul would walk by with a napkin or a small piece of paper and he would draw what he wanted, that one little compartment of the sculpture front to look like. And it was really in the moment. It was a bench-made piece. It was collaborative effort, but something that would never be repeated again. It was per perhaps the most organic aspect of, of Evans's production and maybe that's part of that special appeal. It oxidizes over the years. It gets muted. It gets taken down a notch or two. And I'm okay with that because I would prefer the originality of it. But uh, I have seen some really bright ones and they perform very well at auction. This piece you never get tired of. You can mix it with 18th century English Georgian furniture. You can mix it with the best Louis XVI Reasoner pieces from France. It has lived in my life with a lot of different things from Russian pieces or, and it never tire, you never tire of it. It doesn't compete, it's its own thing, but it's powerful enough and strong enough and enough of an art statement that you know that it is valid. At the time I didn't know enough about it when I bought it, but I'm very happy that it's in totally original condition. I like things, as we say in the French antique world, dans son jeu. It's exactly what it should be, and it's not trying to be anything new. The wavy front that I purchased was not uh, among the first pieces that I purchased. So there, there's all this movement that is happening in the piece that you, you may not initially see when you get bowled over by the piece, but it, over time, is, is you see how that happens. And Did you fall in love with it right away? I, I loved it absolutely right away. Wow, and then living with it. Did uh, you continue falling in love with it? Yes. Did, and did you get bored with it or anything? It's, uh, it's almost impossible to become bored with wow. Evan's pieces. Because as I said earlier, they, they continually and slowly reveal something to you that you didn't see the first time. In 1964, he entered into a new business relationship with Directional Furniture, the prominent modern manufacturer based in North Carolina. With showroom across the country and an extensive marketing program, this collaboration had brought his name to the national spotlight. But the engagement with Directional also came to end Evans' link to the craft world, bringing him into the heart of the world of industrial furniture. Paul wanted to grow, and the studio only had so much sales that he could sell. So uh, the Directional thing came out where six coffee tables, the PE 11 through 16, were produced. Uh, they went into New York on the floor, and within a week, 10 days, 
we were in business because they were selling those tables like hotcakes. And then it grew from there to almost a thousand pieces and then all the different lines. Bigger, better, faster. We had a wonderful home and we got a bigger home. Our vacations were magnificent, but we went on yachts instead of motorboats. A constant introduction of new lines by Directional helped maintaining Evans' name in the world of American furniture. Well, the studio pieces are what brings the money because they were individually designed for that client and no two alike were directional. We may have made 500 of those. If a client has the budget, I always push them to a studio piece. Most of all the sculpture front, which is what he's really known for, they were usually almost all of them signed. And then when directional came along, we introduced the line and we made a, uh, a chrome plate and there were three different plates. One that said Paul Evans, which was applied whether it was brass or chrome. And then uh, a second one uh, was made, it said Paul Evans for directional on it. And then the third one, it said an original Paul Evans for directional. Because at that point, people were trying to knock off the grass and chrome line. While Evans introduced numerous lines throughout the 15-year collaboration with Directional, some enjoyed a particular commercial success. One of them was Arjan. Evans' innovative treatment of aluminum enabled him to achieve surfaces that looked as rich and deep as sterling silver. Uh, this particular side here, when we physically melted it with a torch, uh, or on this side here, we blackened it uh, with ink, and then we etched it in with a, uh, a scribe or whatever. Aluminum is really used in that period by industrial manufacturers. So tin cans, yes, that's aluminum. Aircraft, that's aluminum. But it's very difficult to work with. It's very difficult to uh, mold. In the 19th century, when it was first used, it was used for jewelry. It was a precious material. It was like a magical metal in those days. And I think Evans comes along at an interesting time because, of course, it's the height of the post-war American industrial production explosion. And he's using this material that I think most people would have as associated with very practical uses, and he's using it expressionistically. You can compare him even to Donald Judd, the minimal sculptor, whose work looks very different but also was finding in industrial materials a language to use. And glamour is an important issue with Paul Evans. You know, today it's maybe more attractive to think of him as a craftsperson and thinking about him in the shop. And that's how we perhaps imagine Paul Evans with his sleeves rolled up and his hands dirty. And of course he was a very skilled maker, but he was also thinking a lot about where his furniture would end up and he was thinking about interiors that became increasingly important to him over the course of his career. So he was also thinking about the high life and high style. In 1969, Evans introduced another blockbuster, the sculpted bronze line, known also as Goop. Uh, I, I learned not that long ago was uh, something that Dorsey Redding discovered while watching uh, a boat being sprayed with this material. I was in Philadelphia picking up glass one day uh, and coming along the waterfront and I kind of had to wait for traffic and there uh, pulled up by the, the wharf was a, a barge I believe and this man was spraying something on it and a big flame was coming out of this piece of equipment and he was spraying and it was silver in color. There's a lot of steps to the process. You, you have to have a carcass, you have to goop it, you have to mix the product and goop it, uh, then you have to sandblast it, then you have to spray it two coats and you have to varnish it and then you have to blacken it. And then when you're all done, you got to flap it up and then you got to varnish it again. Goop is a specific taste and I find that half of my clients like it. Paul Evans was very clever in the way he mixed bronze with resin and he made the, gave the impression that there was this massiveness, but he figured out a way to make them not so heavy. In 1971, Directional introduced Evans' Streamline Cityscape series, the most successful and widely received of all of his collections. Reflected and named after the urban skyline, which he loved viewing when traveling to Manhattan, Cityscape was more architectural, sleek and glowing 
than anything he has done before. I think it's, it's much more complex than people realize. And, and I think if you, if you look at some, I think it's like bedroom sets, that they actually look like the cityscape, the, the, the skyline. The most exciting body of work for me that Paul Evans ever made was Cityscape. And it's a body of work that looks back to Art Deco very clearly, has this fragmentary mirrored surface, but also it looks ahead in a very interesting way to postmodernism, the design of the 1980s, a time when surface and reflection and a kind of dazzling effect was very popular. It's a very unusual body of work within his oeuvre. Uh, it's not something that he did for a long time, uh, but it is so resolved and so visually compelling to me. I think one of the things that's most interesting is the way that it uses the environment around the piece of furniture as its composition. So it's a very alive, very, um, very extravagantly exciting body of, of work that he created in Cityscape. And indeed, this is a type of furniture that was very expressly intended to go into uh, city apartments. And so you really want to imagine it in that kind of a context, you know, a, a 50th story apartment on uh, Park Avenue, perhaps. I think that's what he had in mind. In a way, it looks almost like it's been born rather than made. Uh, it's actually quite complex in terms of its construction underneath that veneer of mirroring. Um, and that was something that Dorsey Redding, of course, helped him with uh, to, to be able to achieve that. Basically, it's uh, uh, polished chrome, polished brass, polished nickel. It was always put on and uh, whatever carcass we had, a cabinet, a coffee table and so on, it all had to be flat. There was no bending of it to speak of. Uh, and then had to figure out how to hold that metal on a substrate. Most of that was done by women in the shop. There was a whole department and each person had their own little style. Each one had how they covered things differently. We could build a, we could build that cube in the morning in the wood shop, paint it, cover it and cover it in metal and wrap it and ship it by the end of the day because the process was very fast. And that was really why so much of it was done. Well, Evans made Cityscape through the 70s. Really, for me, it speaks much more of, the, uh, of it speaks of disco and uh, mid to late 70s into the early 80s. It's, it's a party. It shines. It's very glossy, very pretty. It's very shiny. It's very, you know, uh, flamboyant. It's had its ups and downs on the market. I think there were some moments about a decade ago when it did quite well. But I think in the long run, because of its difference, it's a mass production uh, piece that Evans did not have the same emotional commitment to, and which Dorsey Redding didn't have the same involvement with. Um, the long-term sort of commercial market for it amongst collectors today, I think is significantly less than it is for the earlier sculpted front commission pieces. We tend to speak about Paul Evans as a crucial figure in the American studio movement, yet when you go to museums, you rarely, rarely see pieces by him. Yeah, it's, it's rare to see Paul Evans' work on view in a museum. Uh, there are examples, of course, the Houston Museum of Fine Arts has a screen in its collection. Uh, the James Michener Museum did a very important exhibition on Evans, which also traveled to the Cranbrook Art Museum. The revival of interest in Evans's work has been led by the private collectors and also by auction houses. I think in a lot of ways museums by design are the last to pick up on these things because they tend to want to stand back and wait for history to have its judgment. Uh, and certainly now it's time to include Paul Evans in the greatest design collections in the country and I'm sure that will happen over the next decade or two. By the late 70s, Paul Evans' directional lines proved too costly and complex to maintain and the relationship with the company was terminated. 
Evans opened his own showroom in the design district of New York City, where he presented furniture, which was not that different than what one would typically find in other shops. Those were the best times because he was closing a chapter of his life that I think he felt pigeonholed him, and he had the world at his uh, point of view. He opened a showroom on 306 East 61st Street. I think it was almost 12,000 square feet, and it was a he, he could he could uh, showcase his dreams. And he showcased work from his early years up through uh, his electronic uh, uh, period, which I worked with those four years. He had a visit from a company called Design Institute America. And DIA, Design Institute America, was there to steal some of his ideas. And they got to discuss um, what it was that Paul had to offer, and they made an agreement, an arrangement for Paul to design for DIA after the New York showroom had closed. So he went on to design for another company for another five years after the closing of the New York showroom. So his dream changed. And so the man who succeeded to take metal into new horizons and to push boundaries felt that his creative period came to its end. You are you. My father retired for one day. He packed up the small bit of belongings that he had left in New Hope and he drove up to Nantucket to spend the rest of his years with his wife, Bunny. Uh, they apparently had a lovely dinner together on Friday night and he was sitting at his drawing board Saturday morning looking out over the Atlantic Ocean, I'm sure dreaming of wonderful new projects, and died of a massive heart attack. I got a phone call uh, from George Fry, one of the people that had worked for him, and somebody had told him. I can't tell you who, I don't know who. Yeah, yeah. So. And what was, what was your reaction? Devastated. He was young. Very, 56. His legacy and the art furniture that he created are the testimony to the craft renaissance that flooded America during the post-war years. Mm -hmm.